Hello, I'm Randa Milliron. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Interorbital Systems. Um, been developing uh, a series of uh, bipropellant liquid rockets uh, over the last 16 years. Uh, we started our first work with the Pacific Rocket Society, an experimental rocket society out in the Mojave Desert, and uh, did our first uh, liquid rocket engine firings there uh, at that time uh, using uh, liquid oxygen and uh, Methanol we had great success uh, with those original designs. Over the years, we've uh, completed work on uh, seven different types of, of engines. Uh, the current choice of propellants uh, for us is our uh, storable propellants, so white fuming nitric acid and uh, <coughs> turpentine with peripheral alcohol. So I like to say we have very, very green propellants that uh, actually come from trees, pine trees, and, uh, and some of those components come from uh, Oat hulls from the Quaker Oats Company. So uh, quite a unique take on that. Very environmentally friendly uh, um, exhaust products on these uh, rockets. And as you can see, they're modular. They're uh, made of identical uh, components. Each of these tubes that you're looking at in this, in this cluster uh, are called CPMs, or common propulsion modules, because they're common to every design, including this five module, um, FNF30. Uh, so called for lifting uh, 30 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Uh, we chose a model based on a on this single Lego, if you will, uh, this this component uh, that can be uh, actually joined together in in any number of configurations uh, to meet mission requirements. This allows us to uh, expand the vehicle uh, for uh, in. Um, uh, in, in, in our future uh, launches uh, that include the, the Google Lunar X Prize launches, uh, we're planning to use 36 of these modules uh, configured into a, a vehicle to be capable of lifting uh, uh, 1,000 kilos to low Earth orbit and uh, 250 kilos to geotransfer. So we have, um, uh, we have a great deal of experience in our uh, propulsion systems. We've developed engines that are uh, fully throttleable along a very wide range. We have full start and stop capability. Uh, and uh, we have uh, chosen propellants that allow us to build a compact vehicle. Uh, we don't need to make the, uh, you know, the huge vehicle that would be required for, and somebody was mentioning hydrogen. You know, if you use hydro liquid hydrogen or uh, liquid oxygen, you need a massive, massive vehicle. So uh, this vehicle, uh, is about 36 feet long and about uh, uh, six feet in diameter, roughly. It is uh, a very small vehicle, but a very powerful vehicle. You'll notice that it's launching here in this uh, in this image, uh, in this rendering, uh, from an island, and that is the island of Ewa in the kingdom of Tonga. We have an arrangement with the king uh, to use the southern portion of this island and if we can ever get our export control people to agree to allow us to export our rocket to ourselves, uh, they like to call it an ICBM, right? but we, we call it a satellite launcher, and a space tourism vehicle in some cases, uh, we'll have a land-based uh, spaceport of our own. Uh, but as uh, the regulatory environment that you've all experienced or have been describing, you know, it's not friendly to those sorts of things. We've gone to our fallback, our default launch, which is the ocean and the freedom that the ocean launch brings. We're using a, a barge launch scenario, and um, we can use this to great advantage. We can pick a launch site that would be perhaps under a uh, under some or under some orbiting asset that someone needs to reach quickly. Uh, we can launch outside range. Um, you know that, that giant waiting list that you have for years sometimes to get in, to, in line uh, for the privilege of paying many millions of dollars uh, just to use those ranges. We, we think that to bring down the cost of space launch you have to do something different. You can't just do the same old thing and, and uh, pretend that your rocket's going to be cheaper. That, that won't happen. We work at the Mojave Spaceport uh, you know, about a 6,000 foot uh, square foot uh, facility. 
we built everything there. We're, we're totally vertically integrated from, from the engines through the satellites that we launch. This is a the flight test vehicle under construction. This is a single common propulsion module that, uh, as you so imagine, for that uh, Neptune 30 or the um, N5, as we call it, it was five modules, uh, cluster five of these together. And there's a, a third uh, specialized kick stage for the rocket, uh, for the uh, satellite module and this, uh, this version. But this is uh, one of the two uh, competing styles of uh, CPMs that we're, that we're intending to use. This one is a little bit work intensive. We're now using more uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, products to, to, build, uh, to build the units. But uh, we have to build everything here, all these transfer cars and uh, other than that uh, great uh, harbor freight uh, crane up there, uh, everything else is, is built in-house. Um, all the layup is done by a small team. I'm included in that. Nobody is immune from hard work. Right? Everybody has to wear six or seven hats. So uh, we also have uh, several uh, possibilities for testing at the spaceport. We, we operate two active um, test areas. One is complete with an underground blockhouse, uh, data cables underground as well. Uh, two vertical test stands and a horizontal test stand. So uh, we do have a place that is available for testing that has uh, some civilization involved there as well, power, different facilities. So uh, if you're ever interested in doing actual engine tests, let me know. This is a photo of our CPM on its mobile launcher. And again, we can't just go down to the hardware store and you know, buy a mobile launcher. This had to be made in-house as well. This, this will have uh, approximately a 50-foot rail on it for the first uh, test, flight test, that is, which is being run under a, uh, uh, an FAA Class Three waiver. We were talking about that earlier, and yes, that is relatively easy to get. Uh, so, uh, Wait, have you, are you doing this on the amateur waiver? Yes. Uh, this is the full scale. No, it's not the full scale. This is not. This is not the the full performance version of this. Uh, is called the SR-145 because it can lift 145 kilos to a, an altitude of 310 kilometers in a ballistic trajectory. So we could not even consider launching this anywhere near civilization. But uh, uh, this one has specially uh, specialty specially made uh, propellant tanks that will keep us under the and with that propellant load will keep us under the, uh, the limitations of that waiver. So this is a one, like a one quarter, one half scale? And this is full scale. Full, okay. full scale CPM. Uh, this is an unguided launch, hence the fins. And so take those fins off and group this into nine modules. Okay, and that so gives us the Neptune 9, which is our, our satellite launch vehicle for our first orbital attempts. Oh, so this is going to come back under parachute? Yeah. And we actually have, uh, we have three payloads for these suborbital flights. We have King Abdullah University uh, of Science and Technology. We have uh, Morehead State and uh, the Naval Postgraduate School to have the uh, Bach payload space on, the, on these uh, test flights. We're looking at doing uh, one unguided flight followed by a guided flight, and we're going to test all our systems. Again, we'll be inviting uh, uh, some AST folks out to take a look at uh, how we operate and how the systems work. We want to demonstrate uh, uh, propellant cutoff and various things in flight uh, so that uh, when we submit our application package for our orbital launch license, they will be aware of uh, how, the, how the rocket itself uh, operates, and, and we'll be able to gather data during that uh, during those tests. I just grabbed a frame from a video of a throttling test of a, of a um, nitric acid turpentine uh, engine firing. This is a throttling test and we pull the, like, the uh, plume back and extend it. Uh, uh, this is uh, required for uh, our steering systems. And, uh, 
we get great performance with these propellants. You know, everybody cringes when we say acid, nitric acid, but it's actually our propellants are a substitute for the highly toxic nitrogen tetroxide and, uh, and UDMH uh, that, are, that are highly, uh, you know, highly difficult to, to handle, dangerous to handle, and uh, incredibly expensive. In, in this case, this is a, these are propellants that are made of industrial chemicals. They guys just drive up and fill the tank, and that's that's basically it. No military escort required. Uh, uh, they're pennies on the dollar, you know, per gallon of uh, of propellant in this case, and uh, and we like it. Is Always it? instant chemical ignition. We don't need an ignition system for our rocket. Uh, uh, quick question: Are you guys using a gimbal engines or a differential thrust? Both. We have a number, a number of uh, options here. We have, uh, depending on what, uh, what, what is required, we have uh, a vernier engine. <coughs> excuse me, we have a vernier engine test coming up. Our, uh, that's a small, uh, 100 pound thrust engine, and then we have uh, our large engines, around 6,000 pound thrust, uh, that we'll be testing uh, probably within the next month. We've Spend a lot of time recently uh, uh, testing our software and our, our control systems, and uh, and again that's made in house. Everything's made in house, and uh, this takes time. It's kind of even though some of the projects are parallel, it, there's always a linear path that has to be followed as well. So it is one step after the other. I can't really see that too well, I guess. And, oh, this is a, if you're looking at a bottom view of the rocket, a square rocket when it's put together in this case. We have 36 uh, of these common propulsion modules that, uh, uh, lined up to uh, give us what, what is a, a three stage rocket for uh, satellite, heavy, you know, heavy duty satellite launch, uh, some space tourism applications. And we have a four stage uh, version that, that we're planning to use for our lunar missions. Uh, the uh, almost invisible one over there. Sorry for that. Uh, the um, that's the Neptune Nine or the N Nine, which is a nine nine common propulsion modules, three stages. Uh, we have a um, first stage of uh, six modules, and that's uh, that's uh, done a parallel staging uh, method. We drop those, uh, come up on a uh, three. Uh, module configuration, lose the two outer modules, and that third uh, module is the third stage that carries the satellites. So um, what we're essentially testing in those test flights is our third stage. It's a notional rendering of <coughs> our big square rocket. Uh, that's, a, that's an N, uh, N36 there. But uh, barge launch is an option for us. And actually, we're looking at doing that locally. It's one of the reasons we're here uh, this weekend. And uh, this is a uh, we, we like we like the fact of going out of the San Francisco area because we don't have all those messy islands like we do in Southern California that we have to clear. And it's going to go out a, almost an additional hundred miles in your your trek out. So we're, we're very likely going to be operating uh, here out of. Uh, the local area. Uh, what's driving our program and what's funding us at the moment uh, are our uh, TubeSat and CubeSat personal satellite kits and launch combinations. And I was happy to see yesterday that we got a great review in uh, Make Magazine for our TubeSat kit. So uh, pleased with that. Uh, the um, I call it the orbital enabler because uh, in response to the plea from the academic community that we don't have a launch, we can't launch, we can't ever think about launching our satellites. In fact, some people were, were, were resigning themselves to never launch, that their satellite programs were only in the lab, only to build the satellites and never, never hope to launch them. Well, we decided to change that and to offer uh, this special academic price that is a price that is, is irresistibly low. But for us, and because of the nature of our rocket, and the, the low cost, 
methods we use to build it and to operate the whole system. Uh, we're still making money if we sell these $8,000 academic kits and launch 30 of them you know, per, per launch. So uh, you know, people say, oh, you're crazy. How can you do that? Well, you know, we figured it out. We're not going to do this for nothing, right? We, uh, we have to have money to continue on to our other projects, which, which include manned space flights and uh, lunar missions. But this, these systems, uh, the TubeSat, so-called, because it's in a cylindrical form factor, um, it has almost the same amount of space as a standard CubeSat, is uh, it's wildly popular. Uh, like I said, I've, I've not done one bit of advertising on all this, and we, we've sold you know, scores of them. Uh, we came out and, uh, oh, that was about three weeks ago with the CubeSat kit. This is a kit that's based on an Arduino. It's got 60 cells, uh, solar cells, so it's more power. Probably the most advanced kit in that, of that nature uh, currently released. But we, we offer that again with, uh, with a launch. And for the standard one kilogram uh, launch of a, of a standard one U CubeSat, that's around $15,000. I, I don't know anywhere else in the world where you can beat that price. And these are not secondary payloads, I must stress that. These are primary payloads. Each of the satellites sits in its own uh, cube, its own deployment unit on the, uh, uh, what is a, a mass deployment unit that is uh, uh, carried to orbit on that third stage, of, in this case, the Neptune 9. But um, you get everything you need to get uh, the brains of the satellite, you get you know, power management, you get the antennas, which are the, the classic you know, measuring tape, spring steel. Uh, basically low cost, but, but a functional item. And uh, I'll show you our, our uh, launch manifest here. Our, uh, these, these are people who are um, very creative. Sorry for the tiny print, but the list keeps growing. Uh, we have both CubeSats and TubeSats on these uh, missions one and two, which we are intending to use as our uh, flights for the, uh, the Nanosat challenge. Our CubeSats include UC Irvine. We have a Vietnamese satellite on board, the F it's the F1 from FPT University. And the Nanyang Technological University from Singapore has bought one and one, they want more. Uh, we have Google Lunar X Prize teams, and we, te we, 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 we treat the, the other Google Lunar X Prize teams uh, as, uh, and I guess I neglected to say we're, we're in Team Synergy Moon, that's, that's our Google Lunar X Prize team. But we work with the other teams and help them test their hardware on orbit, the hardware that they'll use in their lunar attempts. So we have EuroLuna from Denmark, and they're doing a 2U a two-unit CubeSat, uh, the Robin. We have um, Plan B from Canada, uh, transplanted from the Ukraine, now in Canada, uh, with their, uh, their ambitious mission. Uh, the NASA Independent Verification and Validation Facility has bought a CubeSat from us. And the King of Delhi University has bought two of our CubeSats and one TubeSat. <coughs> Uh, the rest are tubesats in this uh, in this list, and there's Kentucky Kentucky Space through Moorhead State University, uh, two um, actually two Puerto Rican universities. Those are both been funded through NASA space grants. This Inter American and uh, I believe it's the uh, University of Puerto Rico, <coughs> the University of Sydney with their Inspire program. They bought two Aslan Academy as a there's a private high school. And they have a number of uh, students, the ages of 10 to 14, working on those, on their, on their system, a STEM program. Right? Uh, and we have many arts projects coming on board, which is, uh, I'm thrilled to say that uh, that's happening, the uh, you know, great combination of uh, art and science there. Project Calliope, which is a, a um, project that uh, people want to sonify the ionosphere pull those sounds in and distribute them through uh, through the internet for 
uh, used by composers all around the world. Uh, the, uh, this other Puerto Rican uh, project is a fantastic uh, STEM uh, program. They're teaming with uh, Marcelino Canino Canino Middle School. And that, that is actually really a powerhouse of, uh, of space experimentation. Uh, those children have launched, uh, through NASA Space Grants, have launched a number of, of missions with their uh, very, very uh, you know, forward-thinking uh, instructors. But uh, now they want to do something orbital, and they're going to conduct a micrometeoroid meteoroid impact study for that 310-kilometer uh, area, which people uh, call the ignorosphere, because no, no one really knows anything about it. So they're going to study the characteristics of that area of space. Um, there's our team, Synergy Moon, and we're doing uh, comm system validation on this flight, first flight. Uh, Google Lunar Express team part-time scientists teaming with Food and Reason Software. They bought two, to German and U.S. Uh, combination. The Naval Post Graduate School has bought three CubeSats, and they're using those as uh, ad hoc orbital communication nodes for uh, uh, warfighter communication in the field. The Defense Science and Technology Lab from the United Kingdom is doing an Earth observation program. Uh, the Austrian Arts Group, MIR, uh, for their MIRSAT Earth as Art project. Uh, the United States Military Academy at West Point has bought two. Uh, and the Brazilian Space Agency, this is probably the most, uh, most uh, interesting STEM program in the world. These are fifth to seventh graders who are, there are 108 of them. They're broken into teams. The teams are competing against each other to build the best a prototype uh, mock-up of the satellite. The team that makes the best prototype gets to build the actual space hardware. They're working with their, their National Space Agency as mentors. But uh, those guys are really, they're going for it. They're, they're, these students are like national heroes now. They're in the press all over the place because they're building spacecraft. Um, the Mexican Satellite Project, another art project, which is uh, Ulysses. They're Ulysses Sat part of the play festival, and it's a specially composed opera that has something to do with soccer. But that's getting worldwide play uh, as both a science and art project. Trivector Services in Huntsville are doing their track set and uh, intending to buy more. An advertising agency in San Francisco, AKQA, all known questions answered, uh, is doing a very, very secret ad campaign on board. La Dispensa or the Pantry, an advertising agency out of Madrid. Again, many, many different applications here, as you can see. And uh, here's an interesting one, the Golden iPod. It's Voyager Revisited. This is a group out of uh, Bishop California high schools and uh, middle schools in conjunction with <coughs> the sky and spaceweather.com. They're doing an updated version of uh, the Voyager Golden Record. Right, but this is done with the iPod. Uh, and again, the, the NASA facility has bought two TubeSats in addition to the CubeSat. And one of their suppliers, Galaxy Global, bought a TubeSat and donated it to that same education program that, uh, that the IVNV facility is running. And last but not least, seven uh, satellites for the Institute of Advanced Media Arts and Sciences science project in Japan. So as you can see, it's, it's across the board here. And I have, I have 20 additional ones, one from Pakistan, which will be coming in any minute now. Uh, and uh, all these countries, Egypt, Holland, France, Israel, all these people want launches. So the, the, the market's here. I mean, there's no, nobody's waiting for it. These people call us. We don't advertise. They need the launch, and we're offering. So, um, you know, if anybody tells you it's like a, you know, a, oh, this is a fluke, you know, people are just going to do a few of these launches and they get tired of it. No, this is the trend. This is, this is where it's all going. It's all going to the miniaturization. And in our case, because of the way we've designed the rocket specifically for mass deployment of, of these satellites, 
We can do an entire constellation in one launch. We can go to any in launch, if somebody needs an inclination that is different from, say, a standard spaceport, we can move to that inclination and get a launch license for that latitude and longitude <coughs> on the ocean. So we're completely flexible. Uh, these can be, again, the rocket can be used to deploy this mass amount or a single payload, up to 70 kilos. So this is our first foray into the orbital market. As we move on, uh, looking to do probably four N9 launches in 2012. And in 2013, we'll do an N36, which is a 36 uh, stage, I'm sorry, 36 module version of our rocket in anticipation of doing the lunar flights, do the lunar X cross flights. So that's our program. And any questions about that? Yeah, uh, I had a question. You guys said you guys do all the aerospace engineering, but um, as far as the guidance, navigation, the, com the onboard computer, do you guys also do that yes. as well? Can you turn on the light? Sure. So, so what, what is your flight schedule looking like? You're going to do four flights in 2000. Yeah, we're, we're starting our, uh, yeah, we hope to have our first, uh, the first of our uh, suborbital test flights done in September. Then. That slip. We were busy doing the, the CubeSat, had to get that off and onto the market. So we're delayed by a few months. It looks like it's going to be the end of the year for the first flight, and then the second, probably one in January. We're trying now uh, to, to go for a, a midsummer launch, uh, and again, that's going to be a, a minimum of six months for the licensing. Uh, analysis is still ongoing, and we want to get our, our data from our test flights to incorporate that into our license package. So I can't see it happening before <coughs> summer for the first, uh, the first actual orbital launch. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. What's the top speed going to be on the first test flight? At the top speed. Uh, we're we're looking at taking off. We're not, we're not going to exceed three Gs, very likely. Actually, it's somewhere between three and five. Is, I'm sorry. That's the that's for the the large. Uh, that's for the N9. But for the the suborbital flights, so it's looking like around ten. About. Ten, ten years. Yeah, and uh, it's another interesting aspect about this particular type of rocket. A bipropellant liquid rocket gives you a smoother, uh, less shock-filled ride than you would have with uh, perhaps a solid. So um, that's a that's an advantage in terms of a delicate type of payload. Yeah, another question. So if you guys are going to be doing uh, like a sea launch type of yeah. thing, um, you know, FAA clearance is one thing, but uh, do you guys have to deal any anything at all? Do you guys expect to deal with the EPA or environmental? Well, we, we uh, went through a, li a launch licensing procedure in 2000, and we, we got one of the first commercial launch licenses in the world with the help of the uh, ASG. Which, again, I can say very, very easy to work with, very, very uh, helpful. Uh, and that was uh, that was for an ocean launch for a uh, sounding rocket called the Tachyon. And that was to uh, go to 120 miles. And, uh, so it was for the Cats Prize. Essentially. You guys didn't have to mess with the EPA at all. We did. Oh, you did. And that's part of the launch licensing. So we've been cleared for that for that originally. Now the launch licensing procedure has changed significantly since we. So, so I guess my question is, you know, what were your difficulties with the EPA, if any? Um, I don't see any. Uh, the only thing I can see is some of the launch facilities, like the, the national ranges, if we ever wanted to go out of them, which is because of the cost involved, unless Florida somehow gets us a great rate. Right? Uh, it, it's, um, it, it's, you have to go through an environmental impact uh, report sometimes. Those are... You know, from hundred thousand dollars to five million, depending on you know where it is. It's just it's not worth it. You know, it's not for us. It's not worth it. That red tape, that extra cost. Why should we do that when we are essentially our own spaceport? You know, and intend to be. So um, we'd like to have operations in three or four different parts of the planet with identical systems. These rockets can be fully fueled. They can sit at the ready. So they're the essence of rapid response. 
the uh, launches this summer. Where are those? Where are they supposed to come from? Those will be off as California, mm -hmm. and uh, those are orbital launches. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Randall. I'm just Oh, um, no problem. The, the when did you say you were going to launch again? We're, we're shooting for, uh, for the orbital launches for midsummer, and that's ambitious because of the we're still we're still putting together our uh, launch license package, and I want to get data from the uh, the two test flights to incorporate into that right. and to use those as demonstrations. And what are your test flights supposed to take place? Um, first one probably at the end of the year, and the second in January, February, somewhere there. That will be supersonic. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, and um, hopefully, hopefully, fully recoverable. If I may ask, though, yeah. uh, how did you get around? The, how did you navigate the ITAR stuff with the teams? Well, we had to register as defense article manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, one of our colleagues take a kit to the State Department and show people what we were using. Uh, a lot of the stuff is off the shelf. Um, yeah, no, no, I'm not. I'm, the satellite's yeah. pretty off the shelf. I'm not. Mm, but it's still, it's still controlled. We actually still need a, a launch license for each of the. I'm sorry, a, a export license for each of the uh, foreign uh, mm -hmm. shipments. Yeah, we have to get an import license for the ones coming in. Okay. Which anyone in particular that you're looking for? No, no, I was just wondering. Because you, you had. Uh, I mean, for example, I thought, yeah, I see Russia listed down on the bottom mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Well, um, interestingly enough. Uh, State Department says there's no problem with Russia, or with Pakistan, or with Vietnam. And I thought those would be a no-go, because right. we're having some issues, again, I guess moving a satellite is different than moving, say, a you know, giant, as they put it, an ICBM, which right. we don't call it that, we call right. it our right. rocket, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But that's, a, you've got a cold warrior mentality that's hard to shake, and it's not so much the State Department, but it's another group who makes final decisions and advises everybody, I guess, uh, yeah, including the ASD, the MTEC, and um, we've just had some initial feedback that's been negative on that, so we need to put together a compelling argument. And my compelling argument is that wouldn't it be great for a U.S. company to have an active rocket launch facility, an orbital rocket launch facility that could take over in case the national spaceports in this country were destroyed through war or other natural disasters, whatever. You know, I just think that's, uh, and also ocean-going capability that can launch these very compact and uh, efficient rockets. Just one last question. Is there an expectation for people that have purchased these satellites? I mean, if they're student projects, is there an expectation for when these are going to be launched, or do they just say, hey, just launch this whenever you can? Uh, it's, uh, it was pretty much open, so we could change the launch uh, date you know, at our discretion, if, if need, you know, need be. We had hoped to have this launched last year. Mm -hmm. But we've had significant changes in the uh, vehicle design. We wanted to make sure that uh, uh, we've actually shifted from that uh, that original five module to a nine module. We want to make sure if there's any anomaly, any kind of uh, underperformance in any of the engines, any we want to have enough to get these things to orbit. We don't want to be wanting like you know a tiny amount of power and not make orbit. So a kind of you know a lot of flexibility in the shape of the payloads. Like you can, instead of yes. launching thirty. Yes. Sats, you yes. could launch 130 kilogram <coughs> or, or 170 things. kilogram right. we, and in fact that's I'm, I'm looking at these uh, I think there was a thought that we can only launch like a flock or a constellation like this but that's not the case we can do individual payloads and we have customers coming up with those dedicated launches mm -hmm. our dedicated launches we're looking at the, for academics uh, somewhere around 700,000 and for uh, the um, Commercial or government customers somewhere uh, around uh, just under a million, nine hundred and ninety-five. So it's uh, for how big a payload? Hmm? Pardon me? How big a payload is? Uh, it's it's, it, it's capable of carrying a seventy-pound payload. Right, and that's a million. Prefer to be slightly under that. But the million-dollar price was yeah. for a seventy-pound payload. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and and again, we're still making money on this mm -hmm. uh, because the rocket is so radically different in its. Uh, Know, form factor and it's in the way we mass produce those components 
and we're making our own engines and we're making our own guidance system, mm -hmm. we're not outsourcing anywhere. Everything is all iOS technology. Seven pounds, seven kilos. That's kilos, sorry. Oh. So let me, okay, so this is the, the M9 manifest yeah. that you talked about. He was sell, you know, saying he was selling these uh, tube sets for $8,000 a piece, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you could take 30 of them? Oh, 30, 40, somewhere in there. It just depends. depends okay, on so that means you're going to take in about $360,000 total. Okay. Uh, and on these initial launches, everybody's going at, uh, at an academic rate. The tube sets go for more. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I understand. Okay. So yeah, you're, 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 uh, this, this is not going to be the, pr the price that you're going to I'm charge these guys keep, eventually. I'm going to try to keep the academic price at eight thousand, somewhere between eight thousand and ten thousand for the tube sets. Somewhere mm -hmm. around fifteen to twenty for the cube sets. Uh, there will be a two-tiered price system after the uh, first two launches, and the, the commercial or government rate will be twenty-five thousand per unit for the CubeSats. But that's still. Yeah, I was just trying to get you know, yeah. understand yeah, no, when no, you, no, you know, when it, you what? This would be this would we are just we are just making money on this just okay, but, but it, it's paying for itself. Oh yeah, well that's what I was trying yeah. to you know, understand when you were saying you know that you were able to make you know you know to not lose money. You know, by you know, three hundred sixty thousand dollars a launch or what, you yeah. know, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. versus you're later talking about like a million dollars uh, know, for a dedicated for, launch. That's yeah. for a commercial dedicated. Right. Uh, no, actually, this commercial co-manifested. I'm sorry, commercial co-manifested. I've got, and and the other thing is, I have people bidding now. You know, for for, for us, I people are calling in. Uh, they want to know if we have launches coming up, and they're they're saying, well, would you do this for? Two million or mm -hmm. seven million, yeah, right. You know, it's like it, it, it's a product that sells itself. Mm -hmm. it's, sure, it's bizarre. So I'm pleased with that. And and for us, it's the most exciting thing that we could possibly be doing. Uh, so it's uh, our ultimate goal is, uh, you know, somebody was asking, "What do you want to be in the space industry?" Well, I want I want that view of the Earth rise, you know, from my lunar station. Mm -hmm. Eventually, so this is uh, this is leading up to an Earth Earth to Moon transportation system with regular service, and it seems to be working. So, should be an exciting year. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.